Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Arise and Blossom with me, Dr. Arusha. We're going to be dealing with a very important topic today, stamping out sexual harassment in society. And I have some very experienced guests who I can't wait to introduce to you. Okay, and we know that there have been many definitions of sexual harassment, which some of our guests would elaborate on a little bit more. Now, some Caribbean countries, for example, Belize, the Bahamas, Guyana, and Trinidad and Tobago have established legal definitions and passed laws governing sexual harassment. While others, including Jamaica, have draft bills on sexual harassment in parliament. Here in Jamaica, a joint select committee of parliament has been appointed to consider and report on the bill and they have been hearing inputs from organizations and individuals about how to make the law better and how to make it more meaningful. A draft of the bill here states that sexual harassment means the making of any unwelcome sexual advance towards a person by another person, which is reasonably regarded as offensive or humiliating by the person towards whom the sexual advance is made or has the effect of interfering unreasonably with the work performance of the person towards whom the sexual advantage is made or creating an intimidating, offensive or hostile work environment. The draft of the bill states that a sexual advance includes one or more of the following acts or forms of behavior. And these include physical contact of a sexual nature, a demand or request for sex or for favors of a sexual nature, the making of sexual suggestions, remarks or innuendos, the showing of pornography or the display or of images or objects of a sexual nature and any other physical, gestural, verbal, nonverbal, or visual conduct of a sexual nature. Now, the government of Jamaica will be partnering with the University of the West Indies Open Campus over the next three years to provide training and research on sexual harassment in the workplace and related matters. The Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and the sport, the Honorable Olivia Grange, said an important benefit from this collaboration is in the area of training, which will focus on preventing and um, where preventing sexual harassment. In that regard, we must create a vision for, of a new Jamaica where respect, tolerance, dignity, and a high self-esteem are seen as the norm for workplace behaviors, and that organizations take the time and make the effort to offer mentorship and specialized training for persons who have been socialized to show disrespect for women. Now, we know that many persons, many of us have expressed concern that sexual harassment seems very pervasive in our societies. And it is done and experienced by some individuals of every social class, of every ethnicity, of every political party, of every religion, every religious denomination, and of all societies. We know that most victims tend to be women, but we can't overlook the fact that men are often the victims. In fact, the International Labour Organization stated that a study has found that 25% of people surveyed say they have been sexually harassed in the workplace. And a third of these are men. But only 6% of those men affected reported the, the acts of sexual harassment, compared to 20% of women who were affected um, that reported. So our purpose today is to join forces, to do our part, to help to stamp out this scourge in society, this scourge of sexual harassment. And we are not intending at all to make this a political football. We must recognize the need for appropriate socialization and for education, okay? 
and um, so that we can better understand how this issue affects persons involved because many persons are affected by it whether they come forward or not. We can't just make the excuse that as so we say or it's our culture and just accept that that's how things are going to be. We have to be the change that we demand, okay? We have to be part of making that change. So many of us in the Caribbean remember hearing the lyrics of the popular song, Die With My Dignity by singing Sandra of Trinidad and Tobago. Some of the lyrics are, you meet a boss man who promised to help you, but when the man laid down the condition, nothing else but humiliation. They want to see your whole anatomy. They want to see where your doctor never see. They want to do where your husband never do. Still, you ain't know if the scams will hire you. Well, if it's all this humiliation to get a job these days as a woman, brother, they go keep their money, I go keep my honey, and die with my dignity. So we're going to address these issues and more with our esteemed guests. This is not the forum for us to name specific names of victims or perpetrators in our discussion, nor in your comments. However, after the interview session, as usual, we'll give you that opportunity to ask questions of our panel who will answer as best they can. And before they're introduced, as always, please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, we give you honor, we give you glory. We thank you for sparing our lives to see another day. Lord, we pray for all those in our societies who have been victims of sexual harassment. Lord, we pray for the perpetrators, Lord God, that they would see, they would, they would be educated to see how they can change their behavior, Lord God. And for those who need to be held accountable, that they are held accountable for what they have done and that they would seek the change that they need in order to proceed differently. Lord, we thank you for each and every one of our guests. We pray that you bless them in a very special way. We pray that you take full control of this evening's proceeding and we give you all honor, we give you all glory. We thank you for the viewers and we pray that viewers will be enlightened and empowered and encouraged, Lord God, to speak their truth and to do better and to play their roles, Lord, in stamping out sexual harassment in society. So we give you all honor, all glory and all praise in the most precious name of Jesus, amen. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we have Pastor Steve Akbarali, who has been with us before on our Father's Day program. He's, the, he's an auditor, he's a dean and lecturer with Caribbean Missions Bible Seminary. We have Dr. Leif Dunn, um, a senior lecturer and head of the Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the Mona Una, um, Campus Unit at the University of the West Indies. However, she will let you know she's now um, in Botswana as we speak. We have Janice Sutherland, the CEO of the award-winning leadership and personal development consultancy, Sutherland Coaching and Consulting, based in the Caribbean. She provides leadership development and executive coaching for organizations globally. And we have Stacey Ann Young right here in Montego Bay. She's an attorney at law and a partner at SA Young and Associates. She's also an arbitrator and she is also the immediate past president and council member of the Cornwall Bar Association. Welcome ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so firstly, as always, I'll give you a chance in your own words to tell us a bit more about yourselves where you're from, where you live, and what your jobs involve. So we'll start with you, Leith, then move on to Janice, then Stacian and Pastor Steve. Leith, go right ahead. And you can unmute. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as you know, I've been head of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at Mona since 2006, and I'm retiring in at the end of this month. Um, I'm a sociologist and gender specialist. Uh, I do a lot of work on, you know, teaching, doing research in these and other areas, but a, having a real focus on mainstreaming gender in all forms of development. So sexual harassment is an issue that I've been doing work on for a number of years. I'm in fact part of a team to make a submission to the Joint Select Committee debating this um, bill. 
um, having done research in this area with the Bureau of Gender Affairs many years ago. So I'm very keen and hope that we can have this concluded on this round. So thank you for having me. You're welcome. Go right ahead, Janice. Janice Sutherland, so as you said, Arusha, thank you very much for inviting me on this important discussion this afternoon. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I have a little bit of English in me, but I'm actually based in Antigua, lived out here for the past almost 10, almost 10, year, almost 10 years. I work in the leadership development field, predominantly with women. Um, I have been at the senior leadership myself for a number of years prior to having my own business. So I help women navigate the various uh, obstacles um, that, that, that they face coming, go, going up the leadership ladder. And I suppose sexual harassment can actually be one of, the, one of those hurdles uh, as well. So that's, that's what I do. Okay, excellent. Pastor Steve, or should I say Stacia, you go first. Good afternoon, viewers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Stacia Young. As you would have heard um, in the introduction by Dr. Arusha, I am an attorney at law. I have been practicing in Montego Bay for a little over 13 years. I practice at the private bar, and therefore I would be one of those persons who would more or less be defending a person who would be accused of a crime such as sexual harassment. However, in dealing with the conversation that we are about to have and the issues that we are facing, I would just like to highlight the fact that the campaign um, against sexual harassment, especially in the workplace, would have begun at least in the 1970s. And I find it very interesting that it is now so 50 years later that our government has just sought to address these issues by way of legislation. So it, 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 it is a very, very important topic for discussion. It is, uh, it tells me that finally we are, we're making headway, although belatedly so, but I am keen to begin the discussion and to see this, this development in our legislation to protect the rights of women and men in, the, in not just the workplace, but in social um, situations where they could be victims of harassment. Thank you so thank you so much, Stacey. And, and just as you touched on that point, um, I agree. It's taken several different governments, um, you know, from I think they started trying to work on legislation. I heard them say from 2004 here in Jamaica. Yes. And it's still being debated. So I totally agree with that point you yes, bring up. Um, so Pastor Steve, go right ahead. Hey, good evening to you, Dr. Rusha. Thank you once again for having me as part of your panel discussion on this very sensitive topic. Greetings to all our other guests and to all those that are tuned in to us also. As you know, I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring for eight years. I've been involved in ministry work for 30 years. I'm an auditor by profession. And um, I'm also a lecturer at Caribbean Missions Bible School and Seminary, which is a charter of Kingsway University out of Iowa in the USA. I'm also the dean of the school and an ordained minister with Kingsway Fellowship International. Even though I'm an auditor and I work as an auditor, my true passion lies with being a minister of the gospel. The church that I pastor is called JR Ministries, and it's in the constituency of Barataria, San Juan in Trinidad. I live in the constituency of Chagonas in Trinidad. And um, I would not give up serving the Lord and working in ministry for all the riches in the world. And it never ceases to amaze me the transformation that can take place in the lives of people through the powerful work of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Word of Almighty, which is Jesus Christ himself. He is the Word. Good evening again to all. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Steve. So getting right into our discussion, okay? Um, can each of you tell me, how do you define sexual harassment and um, how do you perceive it? How, how, 
how common is it in society and why do you think this is so? Um, Leif, we can start with you. Okay, so I'm guided by the UN definition of sexual harassment and also um, because we have ratified what we call the CEDAW convention, the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women and UN women is in fact the designated UN agency for promoting that. So when we speak of sexual harassment, we're talking about not just the physical aspects of it, which you have mentioned, such as touching, even staring, um, innuendos, having images, or even online, because um, that's something that we also need to recognize that with the internet, it means that persons can in fact be harassed online. So things like text, um, WhatsApps, or what have you. Mm -hmm. But this is a pandemic. It's a pandemic which comes out of how we are socialized um, growing up, um, the inequalities between men and women. And we're saying, yes, sexual harassment affects both, but women are disproportionately affected by it. And it's about power inequalities, power inequalities in um, relationships or inequalities in the society. And the assumption that it's okay to disrespect women, or you know, in addition to the touching, um, sometimes it relates to um, comments that are made, jokes that are considered okay. So there are a whole range and spectrum of activities which encompass sexual harassment, and what we're trying to do is to ensure that people understand it's not okay. And it can, in fact, be very damaging. Emotionally, it can be very traumatic. And the individual feels embarrassed. It's very difficult to come forward and say that I have, in fact, been harassed. Yeah, but The cultural norms that we have in our society are part of the problem that we have, which seems to make it normalized. So I want us to, you know, Put that on the table today. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. And um, same thing to you, Janice. I would agree uh, with Lee for definition. Here in Antigua, we we too don't have legislation. Um, and I just found out recently we have a model. We have a model legislation we've been put we've been put forward. I think since twenty sixteen. Um, it's been interesting coming from the UK where. It's, it's a lot more, there's, there's legislation there, so you don't hear it or see it or it's treated more seriously. What I found the difference being here in the Caribbean is how casual or how accepting it is. And even when I've dealt with cases in the workplace where women will say when it's been a man with a perpetrator, oh, that's just how he is. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make it right. Exactly. So it, so it's so it's the cultural nuances for me that I think are going to take a lot of work, no matter how much legislation we put in place to undo the years, centuries, decades of conditioning is going to be a lot more work and a lot more than just training training programs. Certainly, certainly. Um, Stacey Ann, what's your take? Um, well, my take and, and what I would like to emphasize in respect of sexual harassment is that um, sexual harassment is multifaceted. It's verbal, it's non-verbal, it's, non, it it's sexual, and it can also, even though it says sexual harassment, it does not have to be a sexual gesture or a sexual act. So for example, persons are not aware that a non-sexual non -sexual conduct, for example, directed at a person by virtue of their gender is also considered sexual harassment. So for example, you know, in a workplace where a woman is being told every day that a man could have done this job much better than you, a lot of person don't, persons are not aware that that can also be considered sexual harassment. That is how wide the definition can be interpreted. Now, the most important aspect and what, what the difference is um, that persons need to pay attention to is the most important element of sexual harassment is that it is an unwelcome gesture and an unwelcome um, action. Now, because of that, there's a level of subjectivity that exists 
And because of the level of subjectivity, we may find that what one person believes is appropriate, another individual will find completely inappropriate. I myself have had to change my perception. And I love the language being used by the, the, the co-panelists because it, it really is a cultural system and it is really a way of socialization. So we have to realize that we have to re-socialize ourselves. Yes. When I was in university in the 1980s, early 2000s, I remember being on campus. I remember how there was a young lady from Barbados in our dorm, and she used to come in the kitchen, and I had friends over. I used to be on a sport team, and all the sporting guys used to be in the living room, and she would come down to make her meals in the living room, and they would make comments about her dress. They would make comments about her body. They would make certain comments about just her appearance. Now, I was desensitized completely to the effects that those comments would have on her because I am on a sporting team and that is the norm. It's called, you know, we, we, we ignore it because it's just boys being boys. It's just men being men. And um, I remember a, a very close friend of mine, he was, he was very interested in a lady in the other cluster. And the young lady from my cluster went and told her that he was cheating her out. And I was extremely upset because she, she caused a rift between two persons. And my position was, what if what the men said could have constituted a proper advance? Because in my socialization, it's just the talk. You're walking to the bus park, you're walking on the street, and a Jamaican man cannot see you walk past without saying something. Now, if I were to report that to someone and say I was being sexually harassed by a conductor or one of the, the side men on a bus, I would be laughed at because it is the norm. And I was one person who could not fathom how a woman walking past and the boys in the living room saying something and she would have taken that on as being a serious sexual advance because we are desensitized because of how we're socialized. Since then, I have grown and I've become, you know, more educated, which is, which is one of, the, one of the, the, the things I would advance. We have to be less selfish and we have to really understand that what, you know, there's a Jamaican saying, what is joke to you is death to the frog. You know, you have boys poking the frog, poking the frog, but, you know, it hurts the frog. And we have to realize that we cannot be so selfish to believe that this is normal. It cannot be acceptable. So for me, perception of what constitutes sexual harassment and what doesn't, education and awareness is the only solution to that, I believe, in the first instance. And its prevalence is because we honestly do not believe or think or assess ourselves as individuals about the way we conduct ourselves, the way we present ourselves, and how we, it affects the other person. And before I go, the last thing I will say in relation to this segment is that there is a, a area of, of machoism and you know bravadoism. If a young man sees a woman passing and doesn't open his mouth, it's almost like, is he gay? You know, that, that whole stigma. Wow to you if you are not being overly sexual you're not masculine enough and that is also a problem that we have thank you so much before i bring in pastor steve stacy you you hit on some points that really resonated with me and i too will step out there and even share a personal experience i have had and some of the other panelists have also mentioned that it has a lot to do with how we've been socialized, right? And we have to even look at how we raise our boys. We sometimes idolize this machoism of, you know, even getting a girlfriend and look at him, he's able to even, you know, say nice words to a little girl and it's a little boy they're talking about, you know, sort of sexualizing our boys. Um, yes. For me, I was, <laughs> when you spoke about that girl on campus, um, your Barbadian um, flatmate um, or hallmate, um, I remember I was in an all-female hall on, on campus, on UWE campus. I, I came from St. Vincent, right? 
And when I came, I didn't know many persons. I was a stranger in a, a you know, a, a similar but different culture, you know? And we had to, to, for me to get to the market, to Papine Market, to do my Saturday shopping, I would have to pass an all male hall. Very now, nice. that for me became a walk of humiliation. And now this is where you have, <laughs> ironically, my future husband, my, my current husband, sorry. Then he was my future husband at a different time. He actually lived on that hall. So thank God we have exceptions to the rule. But mm -hmm. there you have men, you know, who are being groomed. And let me tell you, it was not pretty because I dressed conservatively. Not, not that it's on me to dress a certain way, exactly. but you know, Mm -hmm. And I'm walking past and the pot, the pans are beating, the pots, and they're saying everything. They're talking about your body. They're saying what they want to do. And it was one big noise. It was, it was like oh, very, very traumatic for me. And now, for them, it would have been a rite of passage. It's almost like grubbing and, and grooming that, 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 that would, 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 would happen on that hall. Yeah, yeah. So we really have to look, take a very serious look. And we realize that, um, you know, even when I listen to the debates um, in Parliament and you look at the laws that have been passed on sexual harassment um, in other countries, they usually give us a, a relatively short period for reporting the offense. But, uh, you know, somebody, a presenter made the fact that, guess what? It's a lot of males make these laws. And so, I don't think oh, yeah. that they don't care necessarily about sexual harassment, but because of how they've been the socialized, value. it's the like, system, I yeah. don't think they understand the full impact, the, the, the mental, the psychosocial impact on the individual. And we have to do better. I, I mean, I don't think we can accept the status quo. And it's, as, as Janice said, um, it's not just enough to pass laws, but we have to, Resocialize. and resocialize you know and and make it not okay as you said stacy it's almost as if they're not okay if they don't do it exactly. but not every woman wants to hear about her body parts or what you want to do with with them you know <laughs> go ahead pass the steam yeah. pass the steve thank you well i will start off by saying that um it is behavior characterized by the making of unwelcome and inappropriate sexual demands or physical advances. Requests for sexual fevers or other verbal or physical contact of a sexual nature that can constitute sexual harassment. Inappropriate holding, touching, stroking, joking, all right? Um, persistent requests for dating, uh, physical abuse of a sexual nature can all constitute that. And in the workplace, quid pro quo sexual harassment of a this for that nature, all right? I want to share a little bit of statistics here from the United Nations, which says that 50% of working women experience sexual harassment. On a worldwide scale, to 100,000 women, they are reported 15 rapes per 100,000. That is just reported. We're not dealing with unreported out here. All right? And um, this does not reflect a true position of what is taking place in the world. Coming home to the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, you have 133 women assaulted to 100,000, which is 886% above the world average. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 112 to 100,000, 746%. Jamaica, 51 to 100,000, 340% over the world average. Dominica, 34, 226%. Trinidad and Tobago, 18, 120%. What this says is that we have a real problem in the Caribbean, a serious problem in the Caribbean. It goes on to say that 48% of adolescent girls are sexually initiated in the Caribbean through sexual 
harassment. And that is a very, very serious indictment upon us in the Caribbean also. I would say this, that um, there are two critical reasons for this kind of behavior. As a pastor, I will start with sin and fallen media, where sexual immorality is an integral part of fallen nature. It is part of the core human drive, all right? When the creature's stomach is filled, his next drive is pleasure. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how he gets it, all right? It doesn't matter how he gets it. And we have what we call male dominance or male superiority that has been handed down to us as part of our culture. We come from diverse cultures and the diverse cultural backgrounds that we come from, it is part of our culture, male dominance and male superiority, all right? And um, it is not something that we can unlearn very easily because in our culture, we have carnival. In our culture, we have reggae. In our culture, we have dance hall. And sexual harassment is glorified as a part of this culture. Touching, all right? Pinching, all right? Rubbing up on. In our carnival songs, it's all about how we could do it with a lady. So it's part of our culture. And uh, this is something that is accepted in our societies. This is something that I do not agree with, all right? Because it is an encroachment upon the right of the person, all right? It is unwanted, all right? And until we can get that message across one way or the other, we will continue to have this problem in the Caribbean. And even in our laws, even in Trinidad and Tobago, in our laws, our national policy, all right, that has been enacted. There is nothing criminal about it. All settlements are civil. All settlements can be settled by firing the person, promoting the victim, or by financial settlement. There's nothing criminal about it. And unless we could pass laws, and unless we can get legislation there that can criminalize this sexual harassment beast that we are facing, nothing will change. Wow, wow, wow. Thanks for, for, for bringing up that point. And as you bring up that point, because when you listen to the debate in parliament, they're careful to make the distinction between what they call a civil act of the, the sexual harassment um, or the anti-sexual harassment bill and the criminal acts of rape and, and so forth, right? But, um, you know, there was even a presenter that suggested that the impact, even though they're calling it civil, there's nothing civil to the victim about the impact of even the sexual harassment, even though it doesn't rise to the level, level or, you know, of rape. Stacey, you have, you being um, a lawyer, do you have anything to, to add where this point is concerned? In, res in respect of the, the, the um, classification of, of sexual harassment, um, we find that in the Caribbean, it is clear that we have not yet developed um, our legislation to meet the other first world countries where sexual harassment is concerned. We see where, for example, in the United States, there is this ongoing um, case, cases involving Harvey Weinstein and other associates in respect of not just um, sexual misconduct or assaults, but in respect of sexual harassment. And what I, what I found um, interesting, you know, coming off what Pastor Steve had said, was the attitude of our legislators in respect of even addressing the situation here in this country, um, the conversation was, we do not want the Me Too movement here. And that for me was very, was an eye opener. And when we look at, um, for example, the fact that in certain countries, if you breach a contract, you know, taking from what Pastor Steve had said about um, civil matters as opposed to criminal matters, 
If you breach a contract in any country or for some um, jurisdictions, you have three years within which to, to bring your matter to court to say three years ago, we had an agreement and this person breached the agreement. In Jamaica, you have six years to bring a claim. So if you have a disagreement with someone, you have six whole years to determine whether you feel to seek civil recovery or civil recourse in respect of um, this um, act that this person did against you and breaking the contract. This, in, however, this is no criminal legislation and normally with respect to criminal actions the statute of limitation does not necessarily exist or the statute of limit limitation in respect of criminal matters is normally much longer right. why is it that in respect of sexual harassment it is being proposed that it doesn't bear enough weight to even be considered beyond a year it then shows the difference in terms of the value system that we, our society is, play, is placing and the psychological effect that this, these actions have. There's, so, a, there's a significant yeah. Right, I am, so I totally agree with, um, with the point you're bringing up, Stacey. Thankfully, there is a glimmer of hope that because of the comments that were made in the public space about you know, hello, just report, get it on within a year, let's be over with this. I think that there was a, apologies, you know, were issued and it was a learning moment that is happening currently as we speak, let's yeah. hope, where yeah. the committee is now, you know, realizing that one year is not enough at all. And they're now talking about possibly going to that statute, is it six or seven years? Right. Um, but as you said, I think um, Senator Longmore brought up the fact that there should be no limit, <laughs> you know, if, um, if, if that, if that um, can be enacted. Leith, you're going to make a point? Yeah, the issue of time limitations really indicate that people don't understand the trauma, yeah. the psychological and emotional trauma that is associated with sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. um, as a gender advocate and as a child rights advocate, we know that children exposed to this kind of behavior from very early can carry that trauma into their adult life. So that's one thing. So ideally for me, there should be no statute of limitation. If they're going to do it in the criminal, in the, the civil thing, I understand the limitation would be six years. Um, the idea of why this should take so long or why it has taken so long, we need to look at the composition of our parliament. And this, our CEDAW convention says that you should have at least 30% at least of females as a critical mass to be able to influence decision-making. Now, it's not just about the numbers, right? In terms of influence, but also the need for our parliamentarians to have gender sensitivity training diversity training. So that's one thing. I also wanted to note that we've been talking about sexual harassment in a heterosexual um, situation, but you can also have in same sex. Yes. So we need to ensure that the law embraces the diversity of sexual experiences and identities that are there and not just have it as male, female. It can be female, female, male, male as well. Yes, um, I, I'm also concerned about the children being socialized in that kind of situation. Um, and I'll say something more later, but I just wanted to make those couple of points at this moment. Thank, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I see where they ha they've had different drafts of the bill, and I'm talking about the bill before the Jamaican Parliament. And it seems that they've broadened the language to incorporate persons so that it can be it can include you know, harassment, female, female, male, male, you know, male, female, female, male. I actually heard a story, um, unfortunately, of a teacher, a female teacher that harassed. Now, she actually was a victim of abuse in her home situation, and she ended up harassing a 15-year-old male student, you know? And I mean, so we don't, we always think traditionally of, the, the person, you know, um, being the male and the female being the victim, but it, we know it can go both ways. It can go many different ways. So thanks for bringing that point up, um, Lee. 
Janice, do you want to say anything about the time? You know, yeah, what do you I, 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 I would. To report? I don't think you can put a, a time limit like that. Ha working with so many women as I do, just yeah. for them to advance their careers, just for them to have the confidence to speak up just in their careers alone, that takes a lot of work. And there's so many things playing in their mind about the imposter syndrome and their limiting beliefs as to where they got to, how they got there. Having this 12 month, you know, it's very dismissive. It, 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 to, me, to me, it's very dismissive. And one of the things that were, um, was quite a, I suppose, a bit of a culture shock for me, even though I'm Caribbean descent and all that kind of thing, was I'm a runner, I'm an athlete, and I'm, I'm a mature woman. I ride a bike, but I can still get a lot of harassment on the streets that people that, that men think is, you know, you must welcome it because I'm saying something, what I perceive to be nice about you. And I'm like, but you're just making me feel uncomfortable. You know, that's, it's not what I want to hear. I just want to be able to have my run and not feel like there's something could untoward happen. Because there's a whole gamut, gamut of emotions that go with that kind of um, cat calling and, you know, names and, st and, and stuff like that. So I think overall, we shouldn't have um, that, that limit. I mean, because who's to say you, you, you have to work through a, a whole range of emotions. You have to, and depending on the severity of the harassment, you have to have the courage to actually go through the whole process again. So yeah, I'm not in agreement for a time limit. There's certainly not 12 months. Okay, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing. Go ahead. Arusha, one of the things that I would like to add to what um, Janice has indicated is that the truth of the matter is, when it happens to you when you're a young person, you don't have the confidence to speak out. You, you may not find an ear that will be, you know, that will listen to what you're saying and accommodative to, your, to what you're going through emotionally. And then in our country, you cannot bring a suit before the court unless an adult acts on your behalf. Unless you, for example, would have the knowledge to know that you can approach the, the um, child development agency or Sissoka yourself. And most persons who are going through this, they do not have the knowledge or the direction to say, okay, this is where I go if this is happening to me. So if I'm 12 years old and I am going through this, I may not understand what this means until I'm 15 years old and I'm in high school and we're learning about it in a sex ed class. Are you saying that because I'm just being aware that what happened to me before was sexual harassment, I now have no avenue of recourse because of, this, because of these limitations that are being proposed. And we have eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds being subjected to these kind of advances. And they have no, they do not, not only do they not have a voice at the, at this stage of their life, but when they finally get their voice, they are unable to use it. Wow. Um, Arusha, I wanted to I pick up on something you said ahead, earlier about parenting. One of the things that I think is so very important is that we need to look at parenting education in our churches, in our schools, in our communities because what we're doing is raising children to put them at risk, right? So I just wanted to put that on the table as well. So it's an opportunity for us to do anti-sexual harassment training as part of parenting education. Certainly, okay. we, need all of, we need as much of that as we can get. I totally agree, um, Leith. Okay. Um, can you share, please, um, what are some of the scenarios, just to give persons examples, um, to drive home, home the point of what sexual harassment really involves? Can you give some general scenarios that demonstrate um, sexual harassment in action? Um, okay, please? so so one of those you mentioned is you're, um, you are in an, in a place of employment and your boss or a supervisor or even a colleague um, is asking you for sexual favors or sending you texts or rubbing up on you or asking you for dates that's unwanted, yes? Um, if we look at the church, for example, and, and one of the proposals is that one of the institutions we have to be clear about in the legislation is that the church is not exempt. 
So for example, undue favors being asked of the, the minister of the, you know, the, 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 the sheep in the, in the congregation then, right? And you know that many of our churches are primarily women, yes? Um, and then, you know, you have institutions like our schools where, you know, um, okay, if you do this, you can get good grades. And we have a lot of um, resources online, videos and what have you of um, examples of that. So we have various scenarios that provide um, an insight into what are some of the ways in which sexual harassment takes place, you know? Um, there's a lot of resource material as well that we can use to build awareness and change the behaviors. Thanks for that, Leith. Um, Janice, in your experience um, in the workplace, give us some scenarios that you've it's, it's encountered inter generally. It's interesting because um, extending what Leith said, I've dealt with sexual harassment cases where there's been younger members of um, the team who haven't felt confident enough to bring forward their claims because the, per, the person has had longer tenure and they didn't think they'd believe, that they'd be believed. So I think at that time I was senior, so they felt they could come to me as a, as a woman. But then there's the, the, then not so much the blurred lines, but I think in our, our culture with carnival, you're a male boss and you're at carnival, you're rubbing up on a, you know, a member of staff. You know, that is to me, is har it can be harassment. If especially the member of staff doesn't want, doesn't want that undue attention. But you, even though you're outside the workplace, again, there's a power dynamic there once you get back into the office. So it's so people thinking it's just the obvious yes. things. You know, it's not. It's just anything that makes, for me, anything that makes a woman feel uncomfortable constitutes it. It's unwanted, unwarranted, and constitutes it. So I've dealt with many different scenarios, but that was always the blow up for me a lot around social events. Um, you know, the, so the aftermath of social events was always a big thing, even in the UK, even yeah. in the UK, a little bit of alcohol got involved and stuff like that. And, you know, it, yeah, just a mess, just a mess. <laughs> wow. So, so guys, Pastor Steve, what are some boundaries, for example, in the church, what are some boundaries we can put in place to help to eradicate sexual harassment and prevent it? Basically, um, you have establishing conversational boundaries, mm -hmm. physical boundaries, conversational boundaries, not tolerating suggestive language of any kind. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in the church, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the schools, you know, curtail conversations, cut it, so, mm -hmm. or suggestive and unwanted conversation. Jokes, unwanted jokes, personal jokes about the way you look and the way you dress. Stop it immediately, please. All right? Suggestive compliments, you know, put a stop to it immediately. Uh, physical boundaries, unwanted touching, stroking, holding. All right? Uh, take it upon yourself to avoid having any contact with the person. If the person is moving in that direction, all right, avoid contact completely and uh, do not entertain whatsoever what we call quid pro quo harassment, all right, at this for that situation, especially in the workplace, all right. Um, we have a situation now in Trinidad and Tobago where we are in election season, there are two persons going up for elections. And there are allegations against the both of them. One is of a crow nature, and one might be of a criminal nature. But because of the laws, they are not prohibited because it's just allegations at this point in time from entering the election campaign. Now, the thing about it is if the people come together and say, we do not want that, we're not accepting that they will have to listen to us. If we come out and we say, no vote, all right? The politicians will have to listen to us. Uh, members of the party were contacted and some didn't respond. 
some responded by saying, I speak to so many women, the, you know, uh, the person said that they speak to a senior minister. I speak to so many women on a daily basis. You expect me to remember everything? <laughs> now, how could you not remember somebody coming to talk to you about a situation of sexual harassment against somebody that is running in your party? All right? I mean, that is unbelievable and that is unforgivable. And what I have to say is that we have to take actions wheresoever it is to nip it in the bud. And I have to see when something happens and a report is made, whether it's the police, whether it's in the church, whether it's in the workplace, call for an investigation, call for a file to be open. Let records be held and let records be kept. If it is not happening, seek legal advice. We need to put a stop to this thing. You know, it is unacceptable. What, are, what was acceptable 25, 30 years ago, we just cannot accept it in society today. And I stand with women, I stand with anybody that is facing sexual harassment, even if it's a, a male, I stand with anybody because it, in the Bible, God doesn't tolerate it. That's so true. Um, you know, when, God go doesn't tolerate it. And as a society, we need to adopt that approach. Now, the thing about it is with these two gentlemen that are running for office, ladies supporting him, which is unfortunate. If the ladies stand together and say no, they will have to listen. But unless we can come together, especially the female community that is vexed by this process, by these procedures of sexual harassment more greatly than men and have a unified voice and strength in numbers to stand up and say no. You know what? The men will not take you on. The parliamentarians will not take you on. It will be. And you know, you know the sad thing about it? The sad thing about it is that these two men may most likely be elected to parliament. Um, you know, you know, yeah. Dr. Rachel, I'm just piggybacking off what Pastor Steve has said because this is something that us um, defense council know when it comes to gender and how critical females are of other females. That is also one of the issues that, that we face when we're dealing with issues of not just sexual harassment, but also sexual assault. As a seasoned litigator, I can tell you this. When we are doing cases and we are um, selecting, for example, a jury panel, I don't know if everybody has seen that movie where you have the selection with the jury and persons are picking which jury is more likely to. We watch the females. One would think that if you were selecting a jury, a jury of females would more likely convict a man. It is not so. It is the women themselves who are the most critical of other women and their experiences. Because I can tell you this, when we're selecting jurors, the more women you have on the, the juror is the less likely your client is going to be convicted, especially if they present an air of self-righteousness. And you would have thought that they would have been the ones who would be more sympathetic of the female plight and be the ones who would want to see justice brought for someone who is accused of perpetrating sometimes extremely violent crimes against young persons and other women. And this is how insensitive women can be. So when, when Pastor Steve speaks about the support of women, we need to understand that as women, we have to support women and we have to take an active stance in the war against sexual harassment and sexual assault against women and children. If we do not take an active role, it is never going to change. Certainly, I think yeah. it comes back to socialization as probably Leaf can probably pick up here. Yes, this issue of socialization and why women would behave like that, it's about what becomes normalized, right? And some people see it, oh, it's just a little sex, oh, it's just a little that, right? But in fact, not recognizing that this is a very serious issue. But I want to say that we need to have policies in place. So we have a, each institution needs to have a sexual harassment policy, including 
churches, right? Now the policy is there to say, define what is sexual harassment, but also to put in place mechanisms in that institutions to be able to receive complaints, to investigate complaints and, add, and hear the other side as well, but also to make a decision. Now, one of the things being debated now is that whole process in the bill, but also in terms of penalties, right? Now you can have monetary penalties, but we also need to recognize that you need to have behavior change interventions, yeah? For, on both sides, you need counseling for both, but you need interventions. And there have been in fact successful interventions where male batterers, for example, male harassers, um, learn about what they have done, take responsibility for it, and can change. So I'm a strong believer in the possibility of change, right? And that is a form of salvation as well. But the other thing too is that we need to hold, one of the things being discussed is to have a tribunal, yes? So the tribunal would hear cases, investigate, and so on. So we're looking at what is the composition, what is the criteria for inclusion, you know, what is the kind of training and expectation, but also having our tribunals accountable. So we, there's a lot of work to be done. I see it as a great opportunity. Uh, we have come a very long way. This is not the last one, but I'm praying that this round will actually get the act and move us in a different position from where we are now. It is even more acute, ladies and gentlemen, because in the COVID-19 situation, where jobs are very scarce, people are losing their jobs, the trauma of being um, stigmatized and discriminated against, and having to walk off of a job because you have been, you know, the, the victim of sexual harassment, you know, is, is really intolerable. So God has given us this opportunity to reflect to make some key decisions and stop, you know, pretending that this is, is, I think it has taken this long because of the composition of our parliaments. And until we fix that, until we educate everyone, we're not really going to have much change. Wow. Can I, can I just add to that? Well, right, I, go think, ahead, I think we're, you know, waiting if from an organizational perspective or a business perspective, I don't think we have to wait for legislation to put in policies that are right. Um, I've worked in organizations where I've, we, we've had harassment policies, we followed through, we have dismissed people after an investigation, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think, you know, I don't want organizations, anybody listening here to think that, well, I have to wait for legislation to be passed before I can do anything in the organization I lead or whatever. You can put policies in place that you follow through that are HR, that are HR compliant, or whatever, to actually eradicate. And I think once we start doing that in the workplace and institutions, we don't have to wait for the government to tell us what's right, what's wrong or what's right. That's how we start um, challenging some of the socialization and normalization we're seeing right now. Yeah. Um, I and to add to what Janice has said, um, we really need to start calling it for what it is. Yes. We really need to start stating it. Most um, companies nowadays, you would have uh, employee manual. It needs to be included in the employee manuals. Do not whistle. You know, these particular actions are considered sexual harassment. Lay it out there. You have the guidelines. It, even though it is not the law, you can draw from different um, organizations or you can draw from the legislation itself that exists in other countries. There is really no excuse. And, you know, another way of stamping it out is for persons to, 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 to really steer down the, 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 the person, the harassers, and call out their behavior. Sure, certainly. Uh Stacey, I, I totally agree with you. Now, before we look at our last um, question of what other things can we do in, you know, schools, churches, workplaces, you know, the legal fraternity, institutions, parliaments, you name it. What else can we do to help stamp out sexual harassment, especially to help prevent it and change behavior? But before you answer that, um, I'll just like to acknowledge and 
welcome once again our Facebook audience. We've had some comments coming in and greetings. We've had greetings I saw from Michelle Peters, from Janice in the USA, um, from Mandela in Pembroke St. Vincent, and from Cynthia Joseph Peter. Cynthia says this is a good in initiative and she's uh, suggesting that we keep up the good work. She says that is why we need hotlines and social media specifically for children so children can reach out and get the help they need. Children are in social media already. I don't know where Cynthia is, um, is writing from, but um, here in Jamaica, we do have some hotlines, um, you know, where, where children, and I think probably we need to even make those more public. Their hotlines, their social media platforms, their email addresses, and so on, where specifically to deal with issues surrounding sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and so on of children. And Janice says, much needed topic. This is the quickest hour. Um, God bless all the speakers. And she's saying, good show. Rachel Young says, very important points. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for the panel, you can type them out now and they'll be happy to answer. So go right ahead, um, Pastor Steve. Let us know, what else can we do in society to really eradicate this problem, to prevent it and change course? I would like to start from a legislative perspective. Uh -huh. um, in Australia, they have used the words criminal offense and the words felony mm -hmm. as part of their sexual harassment policies. And unless we could get those words inside of the laws that we are rallying for, we just going to go back the civil, you know, situations and firing and hiring and promoting and monetary settlements. All right. I, I don't want to sound extreme here. All right. But let's assume that a young man could spend three months in prison for suiting or pinching a young lady or touching a young lady in an unwelcome manner that will bring a change to the situation. So we need to get the words criminal offense and felony inside of there. And don't just leave it as a misdemeanor. Misdemeanor is a by the way thing, all right? Secondly, most people in schools, in the workplaces, in the church, wherever you are, the common man in the street, they are not going to read legislation when a bill is passed in parliament. All right. And if you leave it up to each workplace to devise a policy, you will have 100, 200, 300 different policies. So what I am saying is get a common policy, a handbook, a manual in place that can be used across the board for all institutions. All right. All institutions. Get, the, get stakeholders to get up to produce a manual. All right, that can be used across the board to define sexual harassment and actions that can be taken to stop sexual harassment. As I said, the average person in Trinidad and Tobago, we, we have a policy issued by the Ministry of Labor, but about 90% of the population is not aware of it. Wow. And the people that are aware of it Maybe three quarters of the business community is not aware of it, all right? Because it's just the politicians, all right? The lawyers would be aware of it, the political commentators, and the average person doesn't care anything about it because it has no teeth. <laughs> it has no teeth. So unless we could get teeth inside of there, you know, you, you will not get, as I said, if somebody could go to jail for three months <laughs> for touching, unwanted touching, or jostling or something like that, it will make an impact, all right? And I just wanna say that um, a perpetrator is a stalker. Wow. A perpetrator is a stalker, and we must understand that. And this person will stalk and stalk and stalk if uninhibited until they get an opening to pounce. And the punction could lead to serious consequences 
all right? Trauma from sexual harassment could be a lifetime sentence for a victim. Mm -hmm. And you know, to add to what Pastor Steve has said, we do not understand that um, for some persons who are not socialized to be strong, um, women or men, it could go to their self-esteem and how they actually view themselves and how effectively they're able to function in the society and how much that said behavior is, not, is perpetuated and the, the cycle is repeated. And this is what we are not understanding unless we do something about it. The cycle is going to be repeated. I think we have a lot of, can I, Alusha? Go right ahead, go right ahead. Yeah. So there are, um, in fact, model policies. In fact, if you look online, there's a whole lot of literature, a lot of tools on anti-sexual harassment. Um, so it's about informing our, ourselves. So that's one thing. The Bureau of Gender Affairs, Institute for Gender and Development Studies and institutions like ours are in fact doing a lot of awareness, um, sensitivity training, um, at university, for example, I served as the gender um, focal point. We have a whole network of gender focal points in all ministries, departments, and agencies, right? Those are entry points. Those are resource persons that can help institutions to come up with and monitor these, these policies. We also have handbooks. Um, the UN Women International Labor Organization HR specialists, there's a whole literature out there. Um, we have a national strategic action plan to eliminate gender-based violence in Jamaica. And that came out of a lot of re research, a lot of um, consultations and so on. And that's available online as a resource, yes? But I also want to challenge our churches. But before I go to the churches, I want us to think of those women in the informal sector who are on the streets just hustling to earn their bread every single day. I want us to think of the domestic workers who are in households that are toxic and have to experience, some of them experience sexual harassment, yes? And um, have sometimes having to small up themselves because they want to keep the job. So those are vulnerable, right? Yeah. I want us to look at having those policies for every single church. Put it in Bible study, yes. the sermons, yes. you know, in Sunday school material and so on. Look at the Bible and you see cases of sexual harassment in there and use those as learning tools. But also all faith-based organizations need to hold our pastors accountable, all our people accountable. We, I remember years ago, the World Council of Churches had this publication, Pastors Who Pray, P-R-E-Y, yes? And the power dynamic there is very unequal and some of that behavior is really exploitative. So there's a lot we can do, a lot of resources available. So the laws are there, let's have the policies and mechanisms for reporting in place and use them. But public education is critical. Wow. So true, so true. Thanks for bringing up those points, Leif. Um, Janice, what else can we do in society right. to prevent? Right, so let me not reel this off here. So um, first of all, um, with Pastor Steve's uh, remark about um, legislation not, and policy, not having a policy in organisations, what I find in the Caribbean that a lot of smaller organisations don't have in-house HR departments. Right. Mom but there are lots that. of but there are lots of HR HR associations that will have policies already laid out that are literally kind of off the shelf, so to speak. That will be you know compliant with the law, the labour laws of the, of the particular country. And you know, as a leader, you need to have the culture where it's okay for a woman, a man in this situation to speak up with that vilification to feel free to have an open door to come and have that and with no repercussions because for me it's often the fear of repercussion that prevents persons from stepping up be that their job be that how they'll be judged be that look you make the man lose his job you know that another man you didn't make the man look like lose his job he lost his job because of his actions. 
you know so the whole speak and the whole narrative that we use in the workplace um we need to welcome it the pol hr policies are there take people through the company handbook as they say have to sign to say that they have read the handbook test them you know there's so much we can do ignorance is not a line of defense i'm sorry not in this day and age there is far too much out there and as a good leader and a good employer that should be part of the the welfare of your employees should be paramount yeah stacy you have anything to add i i remember well in respect of of, of in in my field of work and the legal fraternity um, I believe that there is much more that we can do. I remember when we had the state of emergency, um, the bar, the Cornwall bar in particular, um, there was a drive to educate persons about what this means, what your rights are and, and what this means. I believe that there is more that we can do certainly to engage persons in the discussion and also to, to actually have a fulsome um, conversation about it and to, and to actually make changes to the legislation because we as the with, the with the legal knowledge we are supposed to be the vanguards for the persons who do not have the legal knowledge and to protect the rights of the citizens so we certainly cannot take a back burn or take a back seat in the discussions that are taking place right now in addition i agree with lee in respect of this one you know dealing with it on the level where the churches recognize that they are responsible because there are a lot of perpetrators in the church and it is now coming to light. And when there is a power dynamic as one where you have the pastors and priests who are in charge and that relationship in itself is one where that there's a relationship of trust that and there's a gentle, there's a balance can be tipped in either direction it means that our churches have to take a more active role in educating not just the, per the, the congregation, but their ministers and the staff and persons in service about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. So there's no, no one can say that they are not aware. So I remember what, what we also need to understand is that generations of um, Socialization is not something that is going to be done in the blink of an eye. It has taken almost 50 years for us to get to, to Parliament with an act with respect to this, to this issue. But what, what I do know is that when it is that, for example, Jamaica is not necessarily a literary society, we are an oral society. We speak, even, even our traditions are passed through songs and dance and, and words. I remember when I was younger, there used to be a, a series called Rapping, and it used to be a TV series where they used to go around the schools, they used to bring topical issues, rap with the students, talk to the students about things that are important. Where are these programs? Why aren't we encouraging that kind of interaction and on the level where we include and educate our children at that level? I also believe, for example, I know the Ministry of Labor, they have flyers with respect to, you know, what is um, vacation pay, what are your rights under the law in relation to labor pay. They can also, on the website, include a pamphlet to do with sexual harassment. So I believe that there's a wide variety of options that we have. And what has to happen is that all the different stakeholders have to sit down and we all have to realize that we do not have to wait on the legislation per se. The legislation is important. But there are things that we can do because the law on the, on, the, on the books is not going to help. We need to ensure that persons are aware of the changes, not just in the law, but in the way that we intend to move forward as a society. We have to say enough is enough. Yeah. I um, but one last thing, though, Arusha. I want minute. to appeal to men. Men, not all men are predators. Not all men are harassers. In fact, the majority, I hope, are not. We need men of integrity to come to the fore. We have Pastor Steve here. There are others. And call it out when they see men doing that. So I just want to put that on the plate as well. Um, the women, yes, but men also have to step up to the plate and say enough is enough. That is not um, tolerated. Totally agree. I, 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 I agree with all the comments made. Um, 
I think this is so deep. Our societies are so hypersexualized generally that in schools, as Stacey mentioned, I think, you know, we have to find a way to have these issues of socialization be addressed as an emergency. Because I think we we're fast, rapidly losing our way. As she mentioned as well, a lot of our culture is birthed through songs, you know, and, um, you know, there's the excuse of, well, it's just culture, it's just lyrics, you know, it's, it's just an art form. But the, the, the songs do influence society a lot. So, you know, as, as um, the radio stations, they have to ask themselves, what responsibilities do they have in what they, they're putting out there for us to partake of, for us to normalize? You know, um, ads on the television, just, just make cultural, um, just make courtesy, respect and tolerance normal. I mean, we have to, just in listening in the public, this, with the public discourse and in response this to what's going on in parliament, you hear a lot of men seem to have a particular view, again, because of how they're socialized and women a different view. And so we have to understand, and men know, you know, a lot of men know what is past crossing the line. They just need to pull up their socks and adjust their behavior. Because you may say, well, I'm just telling you, you look nice. But <laughs> sometimes they say, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. You know, and it's not just about looking nice, but you may go a step further and your eyes, your body language can be so intimidating. Now, the challenges, as, as I think Stacey mentioned and Pastor Steve, some women welcome the sort of sexual advances. And so, you know, they may look at another woman and say, you know, so what's the big deal? You should be happy for the attention. So again, we have to also socialize our girls of what should be normal and that their life isn't just about grabbing a man and getting male attention and their bodies don't belong to men. And likewise, our boys need to be socialized that girls are not just there to be caught. They're not just there to be your property to, you know, to, you need, we need to teach respect. And I hope that it's not a lost cause, but I, I have to believe that there is hope. <laughs> Anybody else want to add any, any other thoughts? I am very hopeful. I'm very <laughs> hopeful. Um, we have a pandemic and yes. we have a lot of resources as well. God is good. As you are listening about um, to what is available, I was thinking of the wonderful material that the Bureau of Gender Affairs has in terms of pamphlets, yeah, um, right. others. But, you know, it's there. The internet is there with a whole ton of things that you can, in fact, use, adapt, for conversations, you know, in the, in the schools, in the homes, um, in the churches and so on. Um, there are opportunities for training our legislators, our transport operators, yes. yes? Our transport is another big area or that we have cases of sexual harassment, yeah? Um, and whatever sector you can think about, um, professional organizations, need to take this thing on board. And I'm thankful that I see a step in the right direction. Certainly, Any, anything anybody else wants to add? Okay, thank you so much. I saw another um, comment coming in from Rashida saying, keep up the good work. Thank you so much for your feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just trying to see if there are any more comments coming in. Okay. All right, any other, so you can just make a final statement, Janice, I'll start with you while we wrap up. I don't see any further comments coming in. There's a lot of work to be done, but I would say there are also um, the fact we're having this conversation is also part of the work. So long may the conversations continue and we see some resolution. Amen. Thank you so much for participating, Janice. And she has a book. Um, this this book, Just tell can. us a bit about your book, because there's a chapter in society. This woman can. Yeah. The no BS, I'm going to give you the, the polite version, yes, the, no yes. BS the no BS guide for women who lead. And there's a whole chapter in there about handling 
um, sexual sexual harassment on the white wiring at work or in the on the leadership track as well. So yeah. Thank you so, so much. And thank you so in. much for appearing. I miss Antigo. <laughs> ah, <laughs> we hope to see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Um, Stacey, any final wrapping up comments? Yes, just to say, um, Dr. A, thank you for um, spearheading the conversation this afternoon. And thank you so much to all the other panelists. I'm sure that um, the viewers were very, um, very, very well informed and intrigued by the discussion this afternoon. And certainly, I myself um, learned something. I, I, I have a lot to take away, even during the conversation. I found myself introspecting and, and I also learned about a wealth of, of information. Thank you, um, Dr. Dunn, um, about, you know, for, for informing us and, and the viewers as to where it is that we are able to get the information. Pastor Steve, your contribution has been extremely well received. Um, you know, we're very grateful to you for the statistics that you, you provided. And I, and I, I would have not known um, you know, what the position were in your country, because I do believe that for a country to, 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 to even legislate and specifically categorize um, sexual harassment in a civil category, again, you know, it, 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 for me, it was mind blowing and even eye opening to see where we put our, the, where our value systems lie. In, in, in different societies as to what is it you're saying that financial compensation is enough for my humiliation and that the perpetrators are, 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 are not supposed to be held accountable to the highest degree. So, I mean, bringing that to the fore, I am sure that I was not the only one who has you know, looked at this concept or this, this, this entire topic in a way where we realize that we something inside me has now started to stir. And I'm hoping that for the viewers and for the other panelists, that there is a stirring on the inside of you where you feel that in my neck of the woods and beyond, this cannot continue. So I'm happy that we were given this opportunity to engage in the discussion. And I'm grateful that I am now motivated even more than before to you know, persist and cr create change in my neck of the world. Thank you so much again, Stacey Ann. <laughs> Pastor Steve, any closing comments? Okay, I, I would like to say this. Feminist victims mostly shy away from making reports because there's some kind of fear. They're afraid of something. They're afraid of the perpetrator. They're afraid of victimization. They, have, they may be fearful for their life, all right? They may be fearful of losing something like their job or, or, or you know, something like that. And then you have poor feminists, like all these ladies that we have present <laughs> here today. Poor feminists are women that have stature in society. And what I would like to see is that um, if the poor feminists could come together and create a platform for victim feminists to come forward and voice their situations, bring it to the fore, all right? Bring it into the open, all right? Put it on news, the newspaper, put it on television, you know, use a platform provider. We have something in the United States today called the Me Too movement. As a result of the Me Too movement, people like Prince Charles has fallen. Uh, Mario Batali, an Iron Chef. Kevin Spacey, an Oscar winner. R. Kelly, a Grammy Award winner. Mr. Hoxtable himself, Bill Cosby. All right, Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein. All right, we now have um, the Washington Rednecks being dragged over the coals. All right. And if the poor feminists could come together and form a platform, all right? And hear me carefully, form a platform. You know, we all know what soccer and football is, right? Form a platform, a platform where you could kick the ball back at the goals of the perpetrator and bring it out into public 
all right? And keep kicking, kicking, kicking until you score a goal. Until a local Harvey Weinstein falls. Until a local Bill Cosby falls. All right, poor feminists, come together and do something and give feminine fem uh, victims, feminist victims, a platform so that they could be empowered and emboldened to come out and speak and see what they are going through, what they have gone through. You know, the, 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 the kind of vicious attacks that they have suffered at the hands of some of these perpetrators, you know. Uh, form, a, form a march. If you have a problem, a thousand woman march. What's wrong with that? Where well, you can bring the issue out, all right? Where there's some, something that is radically wrong that has taken place within your society, come out. You know, it, I, I know in, in Washington, they had, I think, a million, a million woman march last year to bring the issue to the fore. We need to do something like that. Why can't we form a, a Caribbean two movement? Huh? Why? Yeah, but but um, Pastor Steve, there has been a lot of activism like that, um, in terms of the physical marches, the online things, um, you know, calling out perpetrators and so on. So uh, advocacy takes many many forms. So you have to adapt it. But I'm saying. But I do want to say, it. pardon? Keep kicking the ball until it's all over. Yes. That's okay, what so what I want to say is that we need counseling support All of for that. persons to be able to come forward and right. take their case through the court system. No so that's problem. a whole other set of services, no Stacey, problem. and I want us to think about. Oh, yes? Um, I think also in terms of, <clears throat> as a final point to say that sexual harassment leads to other things leads to other things. And I'm thinking of the teenage pregnancy problems we have, or HIV, or problems around human trafficking. I'm saying that we need to see that along a, a scale. And therefore, really putting a stop to sexual harassment can help to save lives and livelihoods. That's my final point. Okay, yeah, just to close, I would like to say this to, to victims. It is not God's will for your life. God does not will violence and oppression upon anyone. It is not his will. It is against the principles of, of being our brother's keeper. It is against the principle of loving your neighbor as yourself. It is against the principle of John 3.16, God so loves the world. All right? So to victims, it is not God's will for your life. And Romans 8, 1 says, there's therefore no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Again, the victims, God doesn't condemn you for what has happened to you. He loves you just as much as John 3, 16 says he loves you. And what I am saying is, give your problems, give yourself over to him, and see how your heavenly father sees you. Don't look at yourself as you see yourself as being unworthy, as being a victim, as being traumatized, as how the perpetrator might see you, all right? As how friends of the perpetrator might see you, and uh, as how men may see you. See yourself as God sees you and understand the love of God for you. And in closing, I would like to recommend a book called Healing for Damaged Emotions by David Simon. Healing for Damaged Emotions that victims of sexual harassment can read and do something. To all the panelists and uh, Dr. Arusha, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. Dr. Leit, I must congratulate you on all that you have brought to the table because we need sane, sensitive minds to carry us forward to. All right, uh, Stacy, thank you for the legal advice that you brought to this table. Everybody, and as I said, stakeholders, 
all of us, whether it's the church, all right, whether it's uh, like Dr. Reed, whether it's Janice, Stacey, and Young, if we could all come together, all right, and do something positive, we could win this battle. And the Bible tells us that God hates sexual immorality, he hates abominable behavior. And as a society, we need to adopt that policy and drive this kind of immorality away from our communities, our societies, and our nation. Together we can do it. God bless everybody. Amen. And um, Amen. Speak, I'm going to give you a, a final opportunity to give advice directly to a, to a victim, you know, of sexual harassment. How would you advise them to proceed? Um, you can take the floor. And I would want to encourage us in societies not to victimize victims. That, that, that's part of the reason why some persons are so afraid to come forward because they're taken apart you know and we have a habit of victimizing the victim let us not do this let us not do this let us empathize so Lee, what advice would you give to yes the i think if we, sexual harassment is unwanted um sexual behavior right and it's important for the person to say this is not acceptable i don't want this stop doing it Yes, so that's the first thing. Um, I think also the individual, if you're in an institution, you have to report it. If it's a supervisor or a colleague or what you need to be able to report, you have to report it. Now there is going to be the fear. You might want to speak to someone who is in the organization that knows what is happening, sees what is happening, but may not want to say anything, you know, and but so take some action, right? But I also think it's important to have counseling because it's, there's a lot of fear associated with, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to be believed? What if my boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, um, sees this thing happening or I see these tolls or texts coming and it creates a, a problem in my um, relationship? You know, it has so many dimensions. So taking action, but we have to be sensitive and provide that support within the institution, the framework of what is and is not tolerated as we do in the rest of our society. For people who are not in an institution, there's a police you can report it to. There's SISOCA, the um, Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse, and they are very supportive. They have counselors who can report them. Yes, you can report these crimes. But the main thing is not to do anything, not to do anything. And don't worry about not being believed, you know? Thank um, you. Dr. Thank you so much. Who's that? Stacey. Stacey, go ahead. There's just something I wanted to, have to, to add to the conversation that we are having now. Um, while it is that we are very, very um, motivated by, by what is happening now, and we, we are motivated to see a change, I would love to encourage persons though to, as a, to, I would just like to give a word of caution for persons who are going to be moving forward with their um, sexual harassment claims. I would like to caution them to be responsible in the reporting of the, the sexual harassment incidences and to use the proper channels. And the reason I'm, 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 I'm giving this word of caution is because I remember a few years ago, there was a, a movement by a set of feminists. Um, it, there was, a, I think they were called the Tambourine Army, where they were naming and shaming persons who were supposed to have been um, persons accused of sexual harassment. But what they did was, instead of going to their current channels, some of these persons would have undertaken to go into social media to make certain allegations, unsubstantiated allegations and defamatory remarks in respect to persons. The only um, defense to libel and slander under Jamaican law is truth. So if it is that what you're saying is proven to not be true, you can find yourself um, you know, facing a lawsuit. So we would encourage you 
We're not saying that you should not report it. We encourage reporting, but we're just asking you to use the proper channels and not take to social media or to have, uh, you know, you know, a, a quarreling match or you know, a cussle, so to speak, with the perpetrators. We want you to stand up and confidently outline that the behavior as being purported is incorrect. You can name the behavior. Say whistling at me is not welcome. Touching me is not working, and you you address it and you take it to the proper channel. But please, do not, do not take the movement, so to speak, to the level where you are going to then go on social media or go and tell other persons in a very irresponsible way in respect of what is about our allegation. So it's just a word of caution um, as to how it is that we would love to see this movement operate. I agree with that. I didn't mean to do it outside of the law. No, no, no. Because we had that situation here. Right. Where with with in the ambits of the law. <laughs> right. But get the message out there. Get the message out there. You know, so that, that's what I meant. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I am encouraged. I am encouraged um, by all that you have shared that together we can move a step, a giant step closer to stamping out sexual harassment in society. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you um, for joining us for another program. The next program, we're going to go even deeper. Um, you know, we're going to look at sexual, we're going to take it a step further and we're going to look at ending child sexual abuse okay and that will be not this sunday but the following sunday on august 2nd so please remember save that date and i want to thank the presenters the panelists once again for sharing for being real and for giving um they're such a, a valuable input into this um very very important topic so stacy and can you just close us in a word of prayer please Amen. thank you jesus Heavenly Father, the whole of creation, our nations in the Caribbean, Father, we groan and labor to be delivered from sexual sin, O oh Father. Heavenly Father, we ask this afternoon, Lord, that you cause us to be repentant and to turn away, O oh God, from our sins. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word prevails on our children, O oh Father, and we thank you for your promises. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that in all things we are more than conquerors. So this afternoon, Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for giving us this platform. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the interaction that preceded the words that came from your panelists, Heavenly Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the viewers have been enlightened by the discussion. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the viewers have been encouraged. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this has been an informative conversation that will not just end when this broadcast ends, but will continue. We pray that seeds have been planted where they should be planted and that they will bear fruit. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to guide us so that each one of us will play each our roles in, in our little neck of the woods to continue the battle. Heavenly Father, we know that the, this race is not for the swift, but for those who can endure. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will touch the heart of the legislators. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the righteous righteousness will rise up in our nations. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your will be done. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue the good work that has started and that we will live to see the fruition of the legislations and the different frameworks that need to be put in place to ensure that the scourge of sexual harassment and sexual sin is destroyed. So, Heavenly Father, as we go, we thank you that what has transpired in the, this afternoon, that it is sealed in the realm of the spirit and it is sealed in the physical. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you continue to bless the producers. We pray that you continue to bless your panelists. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for having given us this opportunity. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to lead us, continue to impress upon us, continue to restore us and refresh us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for another program. 
We appreciate your presence always. God bless you. And until next time, keep blossoming. Good evening. Have a great evening.